This podcast contains potentially sensitive topics and strong language. Listener discretion is advised. Well, this is going to be a long night in my little tent here at 10 City 3. We've got water coming in like crazy. <laughs> now I'm just bedding down for the night and hoping that I stay warm and dry. You can hear it's raining uh, pretty hard out there, and my pants are a little wet. I'm trying to keep the water out, but it's coming in, and uh, it's going to be a wet night. And what's amazing to me is I do this one night in the winter, and folks in Tent City 3 deal with the elements every single night. Quite frankly, I don't know how they do it. And, um, you know, my heart goes out to them for just the courage and strength to face this all the winter long. Morning will <clears throat> can't come fast enough. I'm Rex Holbein, and welcome to You Know Me Now, a podcast conversation that strives to amplify the unheard voices in our community. For the past 13 years, I've been fortunate to meet and spend a great deal of time with thousands of folks living homeless. Through those conversations and friendships, I learned how destructive and baseless the dehumanizing effects of the negative stereotype are against ordinary people. People who, quite frankly, are just like you and me. In these episodes, I want to remind all of our listeners that the folks who share here do so with a great deal of vulnerability and courage. They share a common hope that by giving all of us a window into their world, they're opening an increased level of awareness, understanding, and connection within our own community. What's going on here that makes this place special? The family that I got to pick. You, when, when you're born into a family or you're adopted into a family, you don't pick that family. Yeah. They... they they honestly, they they are supposed to pick you. You're born. Your parents kept you. You they picked you. Uh, you. You're adopted. They picked you. But everybody that's here, uh, in some sort of way, I've got to pick them as family. And I know this isn't a journey like everybody stays here forever. Eventually, I'll be moving on too. But the people, who, no matter what stay they are, I know I can 100% trust them. I know that. Uh, they have my back. They know I have their backs. Hmm. I know that I can freely cry about something without ever feeling like fingers are being pointed at me and my my feelings are being laughed at. I'm safe, and there's a community here. I've witnessed new people come in who have absolutely nothing, no clothes or anything. We have donation coordinator, and she immediately goes and gets everything make sure everybody is properly clothed, which is more than I've ever seen anybody do in, in my lifetime, how much people take care of people here and take care of people, honestly, um, who are on the streets. We cannot house everybody. Yeah. You have to have an ID to stay here. You can't be on a sex offender list. And so we, we have people who've come by that um, don't have an ID, um, clearly on something and all they want is like a plate of food or a sweater and we're like the third largest donations in Seattle and so we have a policy of if you ask you you will get it a lot of us have been getting more into like actual city politics and stuff I've been to I think it's two or three rallies now about uh, stopping the, the sweeps and why the sweeps are so harmful I feel like people really need to stop fighting homelessness and start pro- fighting poverty uh, more housing things like that it's, it's not being homeless that's the issue it's poverty of it um yeah uh, i'm currently homeless because i was laid off i can go get a job i can probably go now and save up and get housing but um I'm, I'm not ready to go back to work yet and i i'm not ready to leave the people here there are people here who cannot do what i can do That was Kendra speaking with us. She came to Tent City 3 in June of last year after losing her job working in food service. 
At the time, she was also in an abusive relationship. How is it that Kendra ended up at 10 City 3? Most of us have had barriers in our life, such as losing jobs or being in bad relationships, and have not ended up homeless. To know why any of us are where we are in life, we need to come closer to know more than just what is going on in the moment. For Kendra, she was in foster care system by the age of three due to abuse. She went through 37 different foster and group homes. As a foster child, she has struggled with rejection and depression. The trauma of her childhood deeply affected her. Now, in her 20s, she's working on developing a strong sense of self. She has high aspirations to go to college and get into coding and is glad to have 10 City 3 as a place to regroup and plan her next move in life. Kendra is a success story in the making. She is also a reminder for us that we don't all start at the same start line. Some of us have to travel a good distance forward just to get to where everyone else began their journey. In other words, judging people by where they are doesn't tell the whole story, doesn't tell us where they came from. There is a wide diversity of people who make up the population of 10 City 3. For every person living there, you will find a profound reason for why this is their best choice for now. For some folks, the stay is short, while others stay longer to work things out while having shelter from the storm. And still others arrive and discover their mission in life, turning their experiences from hindrances into assets. For folks who don't know, 10 City 3 is operated by the 501c3 nonprofit called Share Wheel, which stands for Seattle Housing and Resource Effort and its partner organization, Women's Housing Equality and Enhancement League. Both organizations have deep roots in Seattle with their birth during the 1990 Goodwill Games. The self managed community model that Share Wheel developed in the 1990s is one of the first in the country. From the beginning, 10 City 3 has moved quarterly to different host locations throughout the city, mostly to church parking lots. In early January for this episode, I spent two days and one night at 10 City 3. They were located on a small parking lot between the Husky Stadium and Lake Washington on the UW campus. While I got to know a number of residents during the time there, such as Kendra, Osh, Andrew, Ryan, Sebastian, Rebecca, and others, most of my time was spent hanging out with Sean Smith. Sean is one of the camp leaders who has years of experience operating 10 cities and his time with Cher goes back really to the beginning of the organization. We started our conversation with his childhood memories. So I was born here in Seattle. Maynard Hospital, which is now under the, the foot of the I-5 bridge over the canal. Interesting. How old are you? I'm 57, or I'll be 57 this year. Okay, yep. I was born here too, and I'm 64, so yeah. my guess is uh, our paths probably crossed, because back then Seattle was a pretty small town. Well, yeah, the little big town, right? It was the little big town. <laughs> what neighborhood did you grow up in? Greenwood, right off at what they call Licton Springs now, really. Is at 76 and Aurora, and my parents bought a, a house there in the 70s, you know, it was one of those houses that was built the turn of the century. And uh, I remember the the bare wires in the basement and, the, you know, the coal chute and the coal room. <laughs> yeah, and the knob and tube yeah. uh, wiring. Yeah. That that house was a million plus now. I'm like... Yeah. And it's the same shady rundown house. <laughs> can't even can't even get my head around that. <laughs> so what'd your would your folks do for a living? Was your mom a house mom or did she work and what'd your dad do? So that's interesting, you know. My mom didn't work for I'd probably say the first eight years of my life. And my dad worked as an insurance salesman for John Hancock. And then when my younger sister was born, right, things kind of got shook up and, you know, things started getting more expensive. So my mother 
took on a job with Washington Quilt, selling sleeping bags for Eddie Bauer. And how was that for you? Did that change your life when she went to work? It changed quite a bit of few things. You know, the, the, my dad was old-fashioned. You know, some kind of shake-up at John Hancock. Lost him his job, but he worked, went to work at a seed warehouse, Sully Seed. He did that for a number of years. The fact that my mom went to work what was a point of contention, you know. And my mother, she, she unionized Washington Quilt. She was, she was part of a union movement, you know, in the 70s that shook up that company. She got elected shop steward. And she probably gave me my most important value. She, she used to say to me, if you don't think something's fair, do something to change it. That's a good value to have. Yeah. Don't complain about it and do nothing. You actually have to do something in order to make things change. Yeah. Sounds like she was a strong woman. She was. At 17... Sean graduated high school and went straight into the Army. He said he had Audie Murphy syndrome. For those of you that don't know about Audie Murphy, and I didn't, he was the most decorated Marine in U.S. history. Audie Murphy was an actor, but during World War II, he won the Congressional Medal of Honor oh, by standing on top of a burning tank uh, in Bastogne and covering his squad with the 50 caliber uh, as Germans were were invading into the Bastogne region and he called in an artillery strike in and around himself. Wow, that gives me shivers on my arms actually. <laughs> you know, and of course with Rambo and, you know. So you got a little bit of a hero uh I, you know, I wanted Mission to, to fill. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but what what red blooded American boy doesn't want to be the hero, right? Yeah. And also, oh by the way, feels invincible. Right. So, you know, I went into the service with that attitude. So at eighteen, what was going on in the world when you went into the service? What was happening at that so, time? So the Sandinistas had just overthrown the, the the government in Nicaragua. There was a revolution afoot in El Salvador and Guatemala. Yep. And I originally enlisted to be in a special forces school. Or I wanted to be a Green Beret, you know, complete Rambo. And it turns out the Army Green Berets are not Rambo. <laughs> right. So Hollywood got it wrong? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it gave me a perspective. I washed out a, a special forces school, but I had completed uh, special forces pathfinder training. The Army formed a new unit for its elite um, flying corps that they're in joint operations with, with the Air Force. Um, you're probably more familiar with it, with the, the recent takedown of bin Laden. Mm. You know, the Task Force 160 has been around for a lot of years. They're the ones that flew those helicopters in and flew the SEAL team in. But I was one of the guys that uh, was a pathfinder or set up the drop zones and the uh, pickup zones for special forces operations hmm. so that's flying under the radar at night type stuff or jump out of our aircraft you know 14 miles from a location and glide in by parachute so that's what you did that's what i did as an older and wiser man sean reflects on his military days in a different light I mean, I bought, I bought that whole hook, line, and sinker of, you know, we're fighting for freedom. And, well, the truth is, is that we were fighting over the price of bananas. You know, 
throughout the whole time in Central America during the 80s and early 90s, it was about the price of bananas because nobody here is going to pay $5 for a banana. But the truth of it is, is that's what it be, would be fair trade. The whole Nicaragua experience, right, was because the Sandinistas came in and one of the first things they did is to reclaim the land for the people in Nicaragua, right? For the campesinos or the farmers. Because the U.S. Fruit Company, a.k.a. Chiquita Banana, held most of it, right? And a whole nation can't survive that way. The people who you know, whose lives were directly affected, joined us on the East Coast. You can't blame them. No. But as Americans, we're, we're, we're the modern room, right? Yeah. In a lot of ways. We, we have our consumerism stretches around the world. Yeah. And our control for that consumerism. Right. Remind me, how did it end for Rome? You know, <laughs> I think not good. Not good. <laughs> My last overseas tour was Bosnia. I was absolutely sickened by what happened there. Yeah. yeah. Ethnic cleansing. Yeah, I mean it's it's horrible. Well, what human beings can do to each other. And you saw that firsthand. I did and had my hands tied the whole time. I saw and I couldn't do anything about it. To bear witness to that kind of thing and not be able to do anything about it goes against my very nature. Sean got out of the military in 1996 after 12 years of service. I asked him if those experiences are still part of him. Do, do those images uh, find you today still? They do. You know, it's horrifying. But, you know, it gives me perspective too. So... Yeah. Can you share a little about that perspective? Like an example? I mean, I've never seen war. I've, I, I've never... Quite frankly, I haven't seen a lot when it comes to the ugly side of what humans can do to each other. Like, what, what, what kind of perspective did you gain? But I think you do. I really do. We, we see it all the time here. We don't realize it. We, we throw out words like NIMBY, right? You know, meaning not in my backyard. But that, that cruelty of personality is even existent here. It's a form of it. Right. Granted, it doesn't result in soldiers coming into a village and rounding up every male and executing them no matter what their age. But we do it economically in this country. It's such a good point you're making. Yeah, it's that indifference to cruelty to each other. Yeah. You know, I remember a time, in fact, right there on 76 in Aurora, when we knew our neighbors, right? I got a big wheel. When I was eight, 76 is a hill, and it ends right at Aurora. And I not, would start at the top of the hill. Not good. Not good. <laughs> I would start at the top of the hill, and my mother would get three phone calls before I reached our house. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. That you know, was community looking out for each other. Right. I mean, here we are 50 years later, and what the hell happened? We lost that ability to care about one another as neighbors. Yeah, that's big. Yeah, I'm glad you connected that perspective that you talked about to just the everyday cruelty that goes on right. around us uh, that, we, that we've actually made normal. Right. It's always been a thing of the haves to try to diminish the have-nots, right? That, that's as old as man having wealth. Yeah. King of the mountain, man on top. Right. Control the resources, you know, and you control the power. 
but you know for a time it was communities banding together right i i hate to use the word settle right but the way the west was settled was by communities banding together right yeah safety resources right work all of it right but it was community building all the time basically that's what i do here <laughs> yeah that is what you're doing here you're community building and yeah and, uh, i think that's something our neighborhoods don't know anything about in general yes. right like i don't want to i don't want to like uh label all the neighborhoods in seattle but i but i know i've lived in a number of them and you get to know the a few folks around your house yeah you know but but you don't feel necessarily like a community. Not like, I know the 10 city uh, small house villages have have that feeling. Yeah. After his military service, Sean traveled the country a bit. He went to college and also got involved in the food scene. As Sean put it, he dinked around. I dinked around, you know. And Were you in Seattle? Seattle, I traveled the country a little bit. Mm took up the profession of cooking. Did you go to school or did you just... I did. I went to Austin P University and got a degree in socioanthropology. Nice. Was that a good time in your life? It was interesting. I mean, it, it, it's an absolutely useless degree without a master's, but... <laughs> but more perspective. And it's actually something I use, utilize here every day. And, you know, it's... Socioanthropology being the, the understanding of culture and cultural development. And and when you finished, you went cooking? I went cooking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, uh, what were you cooking? Was Are these fine dining establishments? Fine dining establishments. Uh, I befriended a, a guy here in Seattle who was doing Asian fusion. I got in on the cutting edge of that. I mean, I would think that would be a pretty exciting time traveling around and, and restaurant life. And I know, hard, I know restaurant was, life is hard work. It's hard. But, yeah. but also, it's very, I mean, you're a people person, right? That yeah. seems pretty obvious. And, it, and you're around people, like a lot of people. And, and So when you're in the back of the kitchen, you're not around a lot of people. You're yeah. around a few select people. Yeah, who, true. Who, for the most part, are as passionate about what you're doing yeah as you are so yeah so i i cooked for nearly 25 years about eight years ago the injuries from cooking you know falls you take falls all the time really in the kitchen yeah just like slippery greasy floors yeah came down on my tailbone more than once and that accumulated into um, spiral fractures wow. in the lower back and osteoarthritis. So, you know, when, when you work multiple states and, you know, nobody wants to take it on. And, and I gave up on fighting with Social Security a couple of years ago. So you... So just to be clear, you got to a point where you just couldn't work anymore. Yeah, I can't stand on my feet for eight hours, you know. And, and when you work in high-end kitchen, it's 12 to 16 hours a day. And at that point, did you, was that your entry into homelessness? So cooking in Seattle sucks, or it used to suck. The most you hoped to make was nine fifty, and Seattle's been expensive for thirty years. Yeah, nine fifty never paid the rent. Yeah, and that's only gotten worse. Yeah. So you were not only hurting, you were also bleeding your money, any kind of savings or yeah. I mean, you basically were living month to month at some point, paycheck to paycheck, most of the time. And this is like my third trip in homelessness my my first trip was in the late 90s and i ran across this organization that was doing shelter right and they had 
you know, successfully negotiated with the city to um, create shelter, right? The same organization, you know, erected the first tent city at the, the foot of the kingdom and parlayed that into the bus barn. And from the bus barn was born Cher. Sean's life story is woven in and out of the complicated last 30 years of homelessness advocacy in Seattle. He holds a perspective that has been informed by being involved in many of the protests and direct action taken around housing and services. Nonprofits such as Low Income Housing Institute and Share Wheel were born in the 90s and rose to become large established service providers in the city. This history is still being written with current events unfolding, such as tiny home villages and service providers adjusting to the growing needs of our homeless population. With Sean having been intimately involved with so many efforts to address homelessness, I asked him what made Tent City so special. Tell me what's so beautiful about Tent City 3. And and maybe start with what is Tent City 3 because uh, a certain number of listeners aren't gonna know, know what that is. Two words, living democracy. We, we talk a lot about democracy in this country, but very few people practice it. Here it is practiced religiously. Now, part of the problem that we have is the same problem that society has. Democracy doesn't thrive with complacency. People get complacent in... in democracy suffers as a result but that's what this is so beautiful about this place is that you know Tent City 3 is not a social service organization we're not we're a self-help group because you are self-managed as well yeah self-managed means that not only are we making the decisions we're doing the work too A lot of people coming in don't understand that at first. It is a adjustment period for them because, uh, yeah, they're used to making decisions, you know. Maybe they have to do a little bit something here, a little bit something there. But here, it's really, yeah, we've got to talk about the decisions we make Mm -hmm. because we're going to end up doing the work to it. Yeah, we're going to implement it. Right. It's not like you say you want a a shower, right? You want a shower trailer. Well, who's going to who's going to get that? We don't have staff to do that. Yeah. We're the ones that do it. Yeah. And then who's going to maintain it? Who's going to clean it? Right. All of it. How is it going to run? And how are we paying for it? And I mean, one of the other beautiful things that happens here is skills that people had that it might be dormant or they didn't even know that they had mm-hmm. come to the fore here and they discover it. And you, you literally watch people grow. That's beautiful. It was actually going to be one of my questions to you is, you know, it, is this form of shelter... You know, is it just that? Is it just shelter and getting people through? Or do you see growth and, and development? And, you know, and It depends on how people treat it when they're here, right? The community here has a lot of demand. You know, that we do have people that come in and they just want to lay their head down. I get that. You know, you come out of, come out of survival mode here, right? But this place demands that you come out of survival mode. Participation is a requirement. Seems healing to me. I'm, I haven't gone through, you know, the kind of trauma that probably a lot of folks here have experienced, either trauma that brought them to homelessness or the fact that homelessness is traumatic. I don't think that the society really appreciates that that gut-wrenching feeling when you find yourself homeless. That is, that is a seriously traumatic event. I'm sure you're 100% correct. I don't think people do. Dana, I don't think people, including myself, having met thousands of people that are homeless at this point, 
I don't think I still can even come close to understanding the feeling of that moment yeah. that people must experience when they realize, wow, I'm outside and I don't have anything. Yeah. It, it's devastating. Yeah. In this society where everything is at a fingertips reach. But still yeah. unattainable. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's right there, but not for you. Yeah. And that moment of realization is, is, is very traumatic. How was that for you? Like when you, the first time you experienced homelessness, did it, did it floor you? No, I lost my wife. Cancer took her in. And I was trying to kill myself at that time. Because of the grief of that? Yeah. Oh, Sean. You know, and I wasn't doing it in a nice way. I was trying to drown myself in a bottle. And, you know, then I discovered this place. You know, people I knew encouraged me to come here. It literally turned on a light. So, I mean, you know, in a lot of ways, this place saved me. Not only did it save me, it gave me a renewed sense of purpose. Sean was recently elected as a camp advisor, a title that still has to go through the process of being ratified. Myself and another individual uh, have been recently elected by the camp as camp advisors. A good analogy would be that we're the elders of the community and have a great deal of knowledge about the history and workings of 10 City 3. That still has to be vetted through the, the share staff and then ultimately by the, the larger organizational meeting, which is what we call Power Lunch. Yep, I remember the Power Lunches. Right. Both those entities need to approve before that's official. Yeah. Sean, tell me, I mean, it's, it's obvious, I think, to most people that a community like 10 City 3, how constructive that can be for the residents. Tell me why it's also constructive for the communities that you guys go into. And, and explain a little bit about the consent decree where you have to move. So the, the consent decree ran from 2006 to 2016. The consent decree was for 10 years. And, and that was a hard-fought battle. I mean, you, you, it goes back to why we did this. Well, we, we started this as a challenge to the city codification, which wouldn't permit an attend encampment anywhere in the city. They wouldn't issue a permit. And the first couple of years were rough. You know, we, we would set up. And they you know, get swept? No, not get swept. They didn't sweep us. They, they would uh, come through and threaten the church with fines. And mm. they didn't dare sweep us on, on church property. So in 2004, we went to El Centro de la Raza. A good friend of mine, Roberto Maestas, whom I'd known for many years, said, don't move. We'll fight with you. That led us to, you know, Superior Court of the State of Washington. And, and the judge basically said that the city cannot regulate in such a way as to prevent a church from fulfilling their mission, right? That makes sense or their religious mission, right? And he ordered arbitration between us and the city. And from that, we got the consent decree. Wow. That consent decree said that, you know, we would not stay in any one place less than a minimum of, of three months, maximum of, of six. You know, no open flames within the camp. We had to check for sex offenders. 
we we basically move now because it's hard for you know churches with a shrinking congregation to give up their parking lots you know for long periods of time so it's really out of uh, respect to the church that you guys continue to move every three months yeah and is that you hold to that pretty well three months for the most part yeah what I know about 10 city three too and the reason I asked the question about what does it mean for the communities is that I've seen it firsthand and I've heard it multiple times is that you guys move into a neighborhood there's an initial you know, ruckus of community uh, with their with the typical NIMBY worry. Right. But by the time you leave, uh, you've made believers of, of everybody. And it, and I, I know it's not like ironclad every time, but it's it's pretty much right. I mean, yeah, it's pretty much. You know, it, it's amazing. I mean, if you look at the statistical data that the police department gathered around us, I think it's ten years ago now. They, they said 10 years ago that crime dropped 40% in the area that 10 City 3 occupied. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's a lot of eyes and ears. Which equates to more security, less litter, and connection. Yeah. With people that, probably four people living in homes that probably many have never had a relationship of any kind with someone that's outside homeless. Yet alone their neighbors. And let alone their neighbors. Yeah, I see that as a extremely important facet of what TC3 does. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's part of uh, tearing down the negative stereotype. You know, negativity always comes from fear, right? You know, we we've heard it. I mean, it was all over the Seattle Times, of course. You know, the the this fear of well, I'm not going to be able to use my backyard because of homeless people there. And what they're fearing is the other epidemic that is happening in our country, right? And it is a, it's a frightening epidemic of fentanyl, mm. right? Yep. Well, we don't have drugs use here. Nicotine, caffeine are, are the, the drugs within TC3, you know? Yeah. We don't allow alcohol or marijuana. There's there's less drugs in TC3 than in the homes in the neighborhoods that you are. Yeah. We were a little sanctuary in the midst of a, a fentanyl explosion, you know. Well, if you actually read the coroner's report, you, you'll find that the majority of the overdoses are in homes. Wow. That tells you. That tells you something there, doesn't it, with regards to people's feelings that the drug crisis is a homelessness uh, issue. It's, it's, it's not. It's, it's running across this whole country. The, the worst meth epidemic to hit the country is in Dearborn, Michigan. But they don't have a homeless crisis mm -hmm. in Dearborn, Michigan. Well, this is part of the, the solidity of the negative stereotype, right? Yeah. Like, you know... It's, somebody loses a bike and instantly it was someone that was homeless that stole it. I mean, that's crime, you know, litter, all of it is immediately attached to homelessness uh, yeah. because the effectiveness of the negative stereotype. I mean, it's kind of ironclad. Right. You know, and, and it kind of makes sense too, right? Like if you don't have any experience with somebody that has gone through homelessness, that means you're kind of an empty vessel. So the negative stereotype comes in, you yeah. have nothing to challenge it with. And that's, I think, one of the powers of TC3 is going into a community, yeah. and now you're giving somebody some other information with regards to what homelessness is. Right. I, I think that's, that's the brilliant. I think that's the brilliant part of the three-month moving is, is yeah. how effective that is. It is a move hard? Yeah. We refer to it as organized chaos. <laughs> it's a hell of a thing to pick up a community and move it. Yeah. Any distance. Again, how many people are here currently? So presently, I believe we're at 38. Okay. We have a capacity of 100. Okay. 38, is that, has that been pretty average lately? Like, do you go lower, do you go higher? So we were higher before the move. Hmm. We dropped way below that while 
once we completed the move. Yeah. And we're, we're slowly building their numbers back up. And that's, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's pretty typical around moves, right? You, people move Fairly out. typical. And, and, you know, the holidays and the, the, the smashing week of weather that we had here the first week. The ice storm. Well, I mean, it, it started with the day of the move. You know, it, it snowed for about 10 minutes. It rained that. And then we got hit with snow, real snow that melted away. And then we got hit with ice storm. And then we got hit with a windstorm. The makeup of 38 people, roughly, what's the percentage male to female? I want to say there's about eight women okay. presently. And is that also a, a rough hour? Are you kind of on the average? or do you see A little it? bit below average. Mm. We, we tend to run fairly close to even mm. most of the time. And what about the age, the average age here? Now, that, that is a question. I mean, I've got a 70-year-old in camp. And I think the youngest is 22. I have a lot of Gen Zers. I want to say six to eight Gen Zers. That age bracket, Gen Z, is like 20 to 25? Yeah. 26, something like that? Yeah. Yeah. I know you were expressing, like seeing that many folks in that age bracket and what they're struggling with is, is concerning for you. It's very concerning. It speaks volumes to what we're we're dealing with economically here, but you know, the question is how far abroad across the nation does that really what does that represent for us? You know yeah. where where is this going? Yeah. Are they a canary in the coal mine? Yeah. Are they telling us their predicament is that what's that telling us about the predicament of where we that, are. That it's getting bad out there. You know, we've always said that we're one event from the dam breaking, right? We're the little Dutch boy with a finger in the dike, right? Hoping ho- more holes don't show up. Right. Because we're out of fingers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What else should I know statistically about about TC3? You know, the the month before we moved, we had... Three people go in successfully into housing mm-hmm. from here. There's so much talk about outcomes, right? I don't concern myself so much with outcomes. I'm, I'm after one number, one number specifically, and that is zero deaths outside or by violence of homeless people. That's what I'm after. 238 last year. If it were a disease, we would have the CDC investigating, would we not? If it were gang line violence, we'd have the police investigating. If it was a disaster, citizens would be worried. But we see it every day for a person to die nearly every day. Yeah. If those were 238 people that were living in Lowerhurst, uh, Wallingford... Blue Ridge, you know. We, we would we would be going stir-crazy mad with that kind of number. Right. And it just quietly slips under the radar. Mm-hmm. A lot of ways we're taught in society be angry at ourselves for this situation right now it's not 100% our fault you know and it's hard to to grasp that you know I, I could go into all the societal shifts and unfair economic practices that that we do as a society yeah you know, but it, it is much simpler to say, you know, that the existence of homelessness in the United States, the richest country in the world, is a matter of economics. And we saw a little bit of that with the 1% movement 
people were being exposed to that. Warren Buffett said, said it best. You know, he said, you're right, there has been a war, an economic war, and the rich have won. Yeah. What happened to the days of 20% profit? It's 100, 150, 200% profit now. We've codified this at the national level, right? A, a corporation is required to make the maximum profit for their shareholders. Yeah. You know, I've come to the point in my life where I realize that we have, we have a little niche that we work in, right? And here's my little niche in the world that I can affect change. What's what's in your future? What's ahead for Sean? I I have visions. Yeah, what of, are they? Of things. You know, I've been I'm a published poet. Hmm. I dabbled in in art for a while. I was part of Street Life Gallery when that was still What around. type of art do you do? Abstract surrealism. Am I able to find your poetry online? Yeah, you can find it uh you run my name Okay. And the Real Change Archives. And I think my favorite piece I wrote appeared in an editorial section. It was called Blue Papers for Eddie. And and what was it about? It's an abstract character. Right, a, a conglomeration of many people that I have met. But Eddie was a World War II veteran, right, and a father. Hmm. And a grandfather had open heart surgery and slept in a shelter. And you're just giving giving homage to him. Yeah. What's the what's the the reader left with? You know that there are people out there that, in other circumstances, we'd look at look to as heroes. Mm -hmm. You know. And pass over them when they're not in yeah. in a. They're not meeting all the other societal expectations. Yeah. What's your, what's the end goal of the vision? What do you want to see? I want to see neighborhoods coming together and saying, no, we, we can't let our neighbor fall out into the street. I want to, I want to see a, a drive across the country where, you know, we, we just don't rob people of their rights because they've fallen on a hard time. We, we tend to do that. We, we, we try to minimize a person's rights because they're asking for help. Now they're less. Yeah. They're not equal. Or deserving. Right. I have this belief that we are all infinitely beautiful and worthwhile. In difficult moments, around any issue, when we're not seeing someone else's beauty or their worth, it does not mean it's not there. It simply means we're not seeing it and that we need to keep looking. Rather than walking away, we need to come closer. In our society, good and compassionate people are walking away from those that are suffering. How does that happen? And how do we stop it from happening? You Know Me Now is produced, written, and edited by Tomas Bernatsky and me, Rex Holbein. We would like to thank Kendra and Sean for taking the time to speak with us and the folks at 10 City 3 for hosting me for one seriously wet, cold, windy, rainy January night. You Know Me Now has a Facebook and Instagram page where you can join in on the conversation. We also have a website at www.youknowmenow.com where you can see photos of Kendra and Sean while at 10 City 3. We also have stories of other folks we feel you should get to know. Thanks as always for listening. <laughs>